Amen. And so it's good to see everybody today. And uh, those of you that are joining online, thank you for joining us online. It's an honor that you would take part of your Sunday uh, to be at church with us. Uh, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 22 today. So, um, so kind of what we do is we just take a book of the Bible. We walk through the book of the Bible. We do that step by step. Sometimes that means a passage, like a section of scripture by a section of scripture. Sometimes it means a verse. Sometimes it means just a word, because if we don't get that word, we won't understand what everything else means around that word. And so we just kind of take as long as we need to to work through the passages uh, the way that God leads us. And so we're in Matthew chapter 22 today. We'll begin reading in verse 15. So we're in the last six days of Jesus's life on earth. And he's in the temple where we are in scripture. He's in the temple and he's teaching, but who he's really teaching are the leaders, uh, the religious leaders of the day. And so we have this multi-segmented conversation that is taking place there in, in an overarching conversation that Jesus is having with the religious leaders. And, and in each segment, we see, first of all, that he's addressing all of them there together as a whole. It says chief priests and the elders. So that includes the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees, and the Pharisees, the Fer- the, take two, and action. That includes the Pharisees and the Sadducees, which are both parties of the Sanhedrin. The chief priests and the elders in that sense would also include uh, the chief priests, all the priests, and um, the, uh, the Levites that were there as well. So all the leaders of religion in that day, he addresses them corporately as a whole. And then we see this segmented uh, conversations where today we're going to look at him talking just to the Pharisees. Next week, we'll be looking at him talking just to the Sadducees. And then the Pharisees come back for seconds. And so he's going to talk to just the Pharisees again. And in all parts of this overarching conversation, Jesus is telling the religious leaders that the way they do religion is about to change. And so to this point in history, religion was a temple-centric, Jewish-only religion. And what was about to happen was that this temple-centric, Jewish-only religion was about to shift into an anyone can have full access to God at any time, in any place type of religion, which is a whole lot better for us. Not so much better for the religious leaders if you make a, a, a pretty penny uh, of your living based on the fact that people have to come to you because that's the only place they can come. And so they were resisting the change, and so Jesus was telling them that the change is coming. Now, why we're looking at these in segments is because each individual interaction that he has, they teach us something about either the kingdom of God or about uh, us as Christ followers, like what we should do or what we shouldn't do, or about the nature of God himself or Jesus uh, as, as God's son. And so we're, we're breaking these down into little segments of, of the passages. We're looking at them. But as we do that, I don't want us to lose sight of the fact that this is a larger conversation that is taking place here in Matthew chapters 21 and 22. So we're going to begin reading in verse 15. We'll read through verse 22. And so in verse 15, it says, then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. And I want to stop right there, and I want us to have a full understanding of what's going on. So the the phrase laid plans, the way that we see that in Scripture most often throughout the, the New Testament is actually in reference to marriage. Like when you, when you take a wife, when, when, when someone is married together, that, that's the phrase that we have for that. And so if you, if you think about the Gospels and the story of Jesus, you've had people throughout at random intervals coming up and trying to trip Jesus up in his words. This has been one of the tactics that has been used. It's not the only tactic. Okay, so, so you've had people that have come up to him and, and challenged him on matters of Jewish law. You've had people that have come up to him and challenged on the matters of, of things that they did, like traditions, right? So like the Pharisees have come up to Jesus and said, hey, why are your disciples uh, going through and picking heads of grain on the Sabbath day? That was a tradition thing, and so they were challenging him on some matter of Jewish law. And so uh, it wasn't the only tactic that they had uh, to, to attack his words. Now what it's saying is, After Jesus very clearly, the Bible, we've read this in in weeks past where they understand Jesus is talking about us. 
So Jesus is saying things about how things are going to change and about how people have missed it and about how the, the, the God had a plan and that the religious leaders have missed it and we are the religious leaders. He's talking about us. And so what the Bible is telling us is that now they're married to the idea that they're going to trip him up in his words. What, what they had been trying to do in the past is they had a group of people that were dedicated. They were teachers of the law. They were dedicated to trying to trip him up in the things that he did. They wanted to present him to the people as a crazy lunatic, as this crazy man, so that they could discredit the things that he was saying. Then they would also have people, there, there was probably, I kind of guess that these are the, the younger guys in the Pharisees, and they would, they would go out there and they'd, they'd get in these verbal altercations, right? And they try to get Jesus like, oh, what do you think about this, oh, wise teacher? And Jesus always made them look stupid, and I kind of I look at it like the, the older Pharisees are just kind of standing back going, yeah, son, I mean, go ahead. Like, you can try it, but you really just need to wait. He can't be perfect. He's going to make a mistake. We just need to bide our time, let him make a mistake. And when he does, we'll know it, and bam, we got him. And so I think there was this, these different factions in the Pharisees in the way that they were trying to trip. They, they were all agreed that we need to trip him up and discredit him, but the way they were going about it was different. Then what they realized is he's not going to make a mistake. He's too sharp. He's too good. He knows too much. And at this point in the game, like how are we going to convince, I mean, realistically, logistically, right? As a Pharisee, let's say I'm a Pharisee. And let's say that Jesus, I don't know, raised your mom back to life after she was dead. How can I come to you and say, that dude is a nut job? Like, would you listen to me? No, it just makes me look bad for even trying to claim such a thing. And so this is where they found themselves. Jesus had done too much good for them to try to shape him as, as anything other than what he is. And so now their only recourse is we've got to get him to say something to where we can then have something against him. And so now they're, they're married to this plan. They realize that this is our, our only way. This is what we have to do. And so when it says they laid plans, I don't want us to hear that like they're casually like, I don't know, maybe we could get them to say something. Like they're married to this. This is all on, full on, frontal assault. They're going at Jesus with one purpose in mind, and that's to get him to, to confuse his words or to say something that he shouldn't say. So, so then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said. We know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Listen to how they're setting them up. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. I want us to uh, look at a couple different things real briefly before we really start to apply this scripture to our lives. Here's the first thing that I just want to take note of. Uh, first of all, the Pharisees, they sent their disciples. So these were like Pharisees in training. This was like the junior league of Pharisees. So you can, you can kind of look at it like a, a modern day law firm, right? Where the actual Pharisees, they're the partners. So they just kind of, you know, have conversations on a golf course, right? And then the ones actually doing the work, those are the disciples of the Pharisees. And so th this is kind of what they've done. Now, now they've done this for several reasons. Um, first of all, it makes the the number of those against Jesus feel like it's bigger. So, I mean, if it's just them all the time going out there and being like, this Jesus guy, you can't trust him. I mean, it's just going to seem like, okay, they just don't like him. They have a personal thing against him, and it would be easy to discredit them. But if they can send other people out there, then it's going to feel like, oh, man, there's, there's a growing segment of people that are against this guy. And it kind of kind of lends a little credence to the, to the arguments that they're bringing against him. And so that's one of the reasons that they would have done this. Another thing is it gives them plausible deniability. 
So if they go out there and they mess up and they say something, and, and as time and time and time and time and time again, uh, what has all happened previous, they, they try and Jesus shuts them down, then they could be like, well, I mean, that was just our junior varsity team. Of course, you're going to you know, score one in the victory uh, column there. But, but wait till the, the big hitters show up. Like, so it gives them plausible deniability. And then another thing it does is it allows them to swing and miss and still have another ch- shot at it. So now that they're married to these plans, we have to trip them up with our words. We need multiple times to do this because he's shown us in the past that he's, that he's too clever, he's too sharp. It's going to be a difficult task, and so we need multiple swings at it to make sure that it happens. Another thing that we notice is that they partnered with the Herodians to do this. The Herodians, um, it's an interesting thing. Actually, the, the story of Herod the Great is fantastic. Uh, history, if you're into history. And um, it actually goes all the way back to Jacob and Esau. So uh, Herod is an Edomite, which is a descendant of Esau. And, uh, and so Herod the Great and his, his actual grandfather rose to power. And so uh, the Herodians, though they weren't Jews, because the Jews came from the 12 tribes, which were from the 12 sons of Jacob, Esau would have been all of their uncles, theirs uncle, however you say that, would have been their uncle. There it is. I got it. I got there. <laughs> the Bible tells us that, that Esau settled in the hill country that became known as Edom, and his descendants became known as the Edomites. And if you read through the Old Testament, a lot of times they're at war with each other, right? Like the Edomites are like this thorn in the side of the Jewish people, and they don't like each other. And a lot of times they're just best buddies, right? You, you read things in the Old Testament where it even says things like, hey, don't, don't, don't have anything against the Edomites, they're your brothers. Like, let's, let's befriend them. And so we have this long-standing history from actually the beginning of the Israel people until now where the Edomites are form against them, form against them. And then as God blessed Israel, the territory around Edom kind of did this. So Edom is in the hill country, and now all of Israel is here. In that process, what happened is the Edomites were engrafted into uh, as, as sort of Jews, even though they weren't officially Jews, they were recognized as Jews because they were engrafted into Judaism. And so now they, they have a voice in Judaism when they weren't part of the 12 tribes. And, and many of them rose to, uh, to positions of power and influence. And so this is what happened. Now, because they were viewed as Jews, even though they weren't, they were Hellenistic Jews. And so the Pharisees, they would have represented the very traditional side of the Jewish religion. Uh, they're very formal, very, you know, their dress is the old school dress. They've got the phylacteries and they're, they're on like headbands because it says, write this upon your minds. And so they would put it on a scroll and put it in a box and put it on their head so that they could fulfill that law of writing it on their mind. And, and so they had all these things where you could look at them and tell they are a traditional Jew. And then you had the Hellenistic Jews. Right? These are like guys that walk around in, in like cargo shorts and flip flops. Like they're the they're the ones that are just like it's cool, whatever, I can still be a Jew, I don't have to do that, I can I can be whatever, right? And so so this is what the Hellenistic Jews were. And so they what they're doing is is they're taking both sides, the, that those that are very traditional. And those that are not super traditional, those who, who, who would pride themselves on come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and those that would be like, hey, I can be in the world, just not of the world, right? So, I mean, we've got both philosophies, still see them in church today. And, and, these, and these two philosophies, by bringing the Herodians in, why they're called Herodians is because they were unified with the rest of Jews that they didn't want Roman control. But what they thought they should do is take whatever descendant of Herod the Great we can find and make him our king. Now, the descendants of Herod the Great is, um, there's a Herod, right? That's his son. We have Philip the Tetrarch. It's another one of his sons. Herod the Great had five wives from various places at various times. Three of his sons um, rise to power. We see them all in scriptures. The, the, the direct descendants of, of Herod the Great would include, Philip the Tetrarch would include um, King Agrippa I, King Agrippa II. King, King Agrippa is, uh, is, is one that, that had to do with Jesus. King Agrippa II is one that, that arrested Paul, sent him to Rome. So, I mean, we, we see all, all these people, and, and none of them are good to the church. And the Herodians, their idea is, hey, let's make that guy our king. 
So both of them were unified in the rejection of Christ as king for different reasons, and they had different end games. The, the, the Pharisees, they wanted to, to go back to where the temple is the center of all of religion, and so you just come to us, we don't need a king, let's get out of Rome and just make the church the leaders. And so they were wanting it on their own. Then you had the Herodians that were saying, ah, the temple can still be the temple, it's cool, we love God and all, but let's make the, the descendant of Herod our king, and let's overthrow the Roman government that way. And so they had different purposes, different end game results that they desired, but but they were unified in this. Jesus can't be the king. And so they're, they're in partnership together. They're bringing more people along and into this attack of Jesus. And they're coming to Jesus and they're saying, hey, Jesus, what do you think? And, and they're hoping to get him tripped up in his words. They're hoping to get him in trouble. The Pharisees wanted to trap Jesus and depose of him uh, because Jesus threatened their position. The Herodians wanted to trap Jesus and depose of him because he threatened their desires. Now, can we see ourselves in any of that? In our full surrender to the King of Kings, is there anything in us that could just be like, yeah, but I mean, if I did that, I mean, if I was fully surrendered, could I still be the president of the country club? I don't really know. If I was fully surrendered, I mean, but I have this desire that's in me, and I feel like God it may not be what God desires for me, but I really want it. Like, is that, how do I fully surrender? We see this in ourselves as well. And so what, what's happened is we have this picture of this in Scripture of what happens when, when this is where we are. This unified attack, it takes a sharp change in direction. It reveals the hearts of the Pharisees and the Herodians. What you'll notice is that in every attack that has happened up to this point, it's been a matter of Jewish law or Jewish tradition. Every one of them. And now for the first time, they shift tactics, and it's no longer about how to be a Jew. It's about how to be a Roman. They come to Jesus, and they say, Hey, Jesus, you're this great teacher. You're a man of integrity. You don't care who anybody is, like that Caesar guy. It doesn't matter to you who he is. Do you think we should pay taxes or, or not pay taxes? What do you think? They were, they, were trying, they were trying to get him to a point where they could indict him because they knew they couldn't get him to a point where they could simply discredit him. He had done too much good. He was, had too big of a following, too much influence. Everything he said made too much sense. They couldn't discredit him. They had to get to a point where they could indict him. They knew they couldn't label him as crazy, so they had to label him as a threat of insurrection. So what this would do is it would no longer shift the people's eyes of the Jewish nation if they could get the, the Romans to shift the way they, they look at Jesus, then it would serve the same purpose. They were just trying to get rid of Jesus, and they didn't care how it went. And so this is what they decided to do. Let's label him as a threat of insurrection. Let's get him to say some things against Rome, against Caesar. And if we can do this, then the Romans will get involved, and they'll take care of the problem for us because we can't take care of the problem on our own. So Jesus' uh, response was more than just a clever wordplay. Uh, Render under Caesar that which is Caesar's, and under God that which is God's. I mean, that's, that's pretty clever, right? That's a really good response. If I gave that response, if I had come up with that when they walked away, I'd have been like, bam, nailed it. I mean, that's, it's, but it was more than just clever wordplay, right? I know there are a lot of preachers that would like to tell you, um, well, what, what Jesus was saying is that you should pay your taxes and that you should give an equal amount to the church because you can't put your government ahead of your God. And, and so, and you know, when taxes feel like they're 116% of your earned income, that would be a great philosophy for a church to have, right? No, that would kill you. Um, but here's the thing Jesus, like Jesus does a lot of times, he, he's talking about their money without actually really talking about their money. They ask these questions, and in Jesus' response, what he's really doing 
is revealing their heart. And we can learn things about the way that, that the Pharisees and Herodians viewed the world. This is their world view. So a worldview is the way that you view yourself and the way you view the world around you. And the worldview that you have will shape the way that you view yourself and the way that you view the world around you. And, and, and it will shape the way that you interact with the world around you because of how you view yourself and the world around you. If I think the world around me is a really harsh place, I'm going to be shielded from the world. I'm going to interact with them less. If I think the world around me is my playground, then I'm just going to frolic through everything with no worries at all. How I view the world around me and how I view myself in that world, it will change the way that I interact with it. This is called a worldview. And so what Jesus is doing is he's, he's calling out the worldview that they have in their heart through the way that he's interacting with them, through the answers that he gives, and it's much larger than just their money. What should be the basis for our worldview according to this text, according to this passage? The way we see ourselves and the way that we see the world around us. Um, what I really feel like Jesus is hinting at is called Imago Dei. And that's not what come when me one go home. <laughs> that's Latin, darling. Evidently, Mr. Ringo is an educated man. This random movie quote brought to you by Frank and Jennifer Giles. <laughs> it's Latin, and it means the image of God. Now, Imago Dei is something that philosophers talk about. It's something that's kind of this high and lofty thing, but it's not. It should be something that we all understand and that shapes the way that we see the world around us and the way that we see ourselves in the world. This is something that should inform our worldview. It should be the basis of our worldview, imago Dei, the image of God. And I want us to think about this. The very first thing that we see recorded in Scripture that God said about mankind is found in Genesis chapter 1. So I want us to look at this because typically in Scripture, the first thing that's said is of utmost importance. So this is the very first thing that God said about us as as, as creation. We're going to read in uh, verses 26 and 7. It says, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. So, so the very first thing that God says about us is that we are to bear his image, that we will be image bearers of him. This separates us from all other creation. While you can look at creation and understand that if there is creation, there must be a creator, the Bible tells us that all creation points us to the fact that there is a God that rules and reigns in supreme. So while we can look at a cow and we can say, there's a God that made the cow, we shouldn't look at a cow and say, that cow's my God. I see God in that cow. We should be able to interact with humans and see the differences in their lives and to see the way that they've changed as they've grown in their relationship with God. And we should be able to say, man, God forming himself in that person is the only reason they can do what they just did. Because we bear the image of God. He made us in his image. And that means something. It's weighty to us. It changes the way that we see ourselves. And it changes the way that we interact with the world around us. That we are the image bearers of God. Now, I want us to keep that passage in mind as we read through part of our text today, okay? So, so God's saying, let us make mankind in our image, and then he did. He did that. He made male and female in his image. Let's flip back over to the middle of verse 16 in Matthew 22. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. 
And he said to them, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. Now, this is, again, this is not a commentary on their money. God wasn't telling these guys that they should tithe more. You know what? The Pharisees tithed even from the spices that grew in their garden. When it came to giving to support the temple, these guys crushed it. This was not a commentary on giving. This was a commentary on how they saw themselves. Whose image is this? Caesar's, sort of. Whose image is Caesar in? God's? When we, when we have the understanding of the way that God sees us, that we are made in his image, that he did that, and that he did it intentionally, when we understand this, then it, it makes it a little bit different of a, of a question for Jesus to say, well, whose image is on the coin? It's Caesar's image. Okay, well, that's only part, part true, right? It's like when you're in school and your teacher thinks they're really clever and they give you a, a test and it's a multiple choice test, and three of the four answers are right, but they want you to choose the one that's most right? Like, this is what Jesus is doing, right? Who, whose is that? Caesar's? Mm, but that's not the most right answer. I mean, it's a answer. I'll tell you what, I'll give you half credit for it. Which is great, Pharisees, because you've been with him, like, since we started this thing. So you're finally at a point where you get half credit. This is good for you. This is, this is what Jesus is doing. Caesar's is a right answer, but it's not the answer that Jesus was looking for, and it's not the answer that should reveal that they view themselves as gods. When they view themselves as gods, then even their money is gods. And so when Jesus says, whose image is this? Well, I know it, it looks like Caesar, but man, Caesar was made in the image of God. That should have been their answer. And, and the same thing applies to us, right? Right? I know that I just answered that question for you, but really, I'm made in the image of God, so God's the one that gave me the ability to answer that question for you, and it's all his. All knowledge is his. Everything belongs to him. Even the way that I look at the money, right? It's God's money. Whose image is this? Caesar's, sort of. It, it, what he was really looking for is we are made in the image of God, and when we bear the Imago Dei, and when we have a full understanding of what that really means, and we allow the weight of that, to fully rest on us, the way we see the world is not through, here's the government, here's my role in church, here's my role in, in my job, here's my role in my family. We don't compartmentalize any of it. It's all God's. And here's my role, to show people in the world God because I bear his image. And that role doesn't change, and it doesn't matter if I'm standing in line to vote. It doesn't matter if I'm going to work for the day. It doesn't matter if I'm reading a book to my kids. It doesn't matter if I'm on a lunch date with my wife. It does not change. My role is simply just to show people Jesus through me because I bear the image of God. See, the Pharisees and the Herodians they viewed themselves through their earthly titles. They were leaders in the community. They were uh, husbands and fathers. They were teachers. They were um, anti-Jesus. They were pro-Jewish sovereignty. You can fill in the blanks with our, with our own, right? These are our earthly titles. I'm a pastor. I'm a husband. I'm a father. But the first thing that should come to mind when someone says, who is Brock? My first answer should be Brock is God's. That's it. And not because I learned in Sunday school that that's the right thing to say. Not because it just makes sense. Not because it sounds good. Not because even it makes me feel good but because I have a true understanding that I bear his image. And that changes the way that I interact with the people around me, right? If I bear the image, of, am I bearing the image of God if Brahms messes up my order, which is 97% of the time, and I drive back through the drive-thru and 
throw it at them through the window. Is that image bearing well? No. So what do I do? I eat the salad they gave me when I ordered a burger. No, I, I mean, you can, you can take it. You can get what you order. Like, I'm not saying I'll do that. But I mean, do it in, in a nice way, right? Like, when I have the understanding that this, this is me imaging God, it should change the way that I treat people. It should change the way that I interact with society. It should change, it should change everything about the way that I do everything. The Pharisees and the Herodians did not view themselves as gods. Now, if you had talked to them about it, they knew the right answer. And, and there are points as we look through the history of everything that we've already studied in Matthew where they, where they say things like, well, Abraham's our father. We're Jews. Like they knew they belonged to God. They would teach people we are a people that are separate from, from the world around us. We were that was designed by God, like they knew that, but it wasn't their automatic view. They didn't view their interactions with Jesus as being image bearers of God. And just in case you're wondering, where we get the concept of Imago Dei is the Old Testament, right? I read Genesis 1. You don't get a whole lot more early than that in scriptures. These cats had this part of Bible. They knew this knowledge, this isn't New Testament knowledge that's, that's yet to be written. This is stuff that they knew that they should have known that should have shaped their worldview, and it did not. And so Jesus says, whose image is it? Same question applies to us. When you look in the mirror in the morning, you should hear God's voice say, whose image is that? Well, that's my image. Part credit. It is your image. So you can run a comb through your hair. If you have hair, I don't. It's whatever. <laughs> like it's your image, right? That's part credit. But it's also God's image. And when you understand that, it changes the way that you interact with the world around you. The fact that we bear God's image is what encapsulates all of the commands in Scripture. So why should we be holy? Because God is holy and we bear his image. Why should we not murder? Because we bear the image of God. Why should we not covet? Why should we not lie? Because we bear the image of God. Why should we have self-control? Because we bear God's image. Why should we put on the armor of God? Because we bear God's image. Why should we um, not just only think hi too highly of ourselves? Or why should we only look after our own interests instead of the interests of others? Because we bear God's image. Like This is what encapsulates every command of Scripture. You can look at anything that you see and you can answer the question of why should I do that with because I bear God's image. Why should I faithfully do the things God put in front of me to do? Because I bear his image. It's his image. This fundamental piece of knowledge changes us. But the question is how, and I think we see that in this passage as well. How does Imago Dei change us. You see, Jesus didn't stop with the image. He went deeper. And I think we learn from that. I think this was intentional on his part. In verse 18, it says, but Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, you hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, whose image is this and whose inscription? It was more than just the fact that we bear the image of God. He said, whose image is that and whose inscription? He, he, he listed that separately with intent. The answer was the same as far as the Pharisees and the Herodians. Caesar's. Okay, again, partial credit. It does say Caesar's name, but that doesn't mean that's his inscription. It's not, it's not what Jesus was looking for, right? The Bible teaches us that the law of God is written or inscribed on our hearts. We see this in Exodus 13, Proverbs 7, Isaiah 44, Jeremiah 31, Ezekiel 11 and 36, Romans chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 8, and that's just a, what, what came to mind. That's not an exhaustive list. This is a theme that is on repeat throughout all of Scripture, that God's law is written on our hearts. And so not only do we bear his image, but we also bear his inscription.
And when his law is inscribed on our hearts, then it changes what comes out of our mouth. That's the Bible too. And so if what is coming out of our mouth does not image him, then it means we need him to inscribe more on our hearts. So he says, basically, whose money is this? Well, that could be, lead to an argument, right? I mean, the guy that brought the coin would be like, it's my money. And they could be like, nah, it's taxes, so really it's Caesar's, and it's got his picture on it, it's his name on it. This is the tax. It's, that's Caesar's money, right? Jesus could have put it in his pocket and said, it's mine now, because I'm Jesus. I can run from you and you can't catch me because I can run on water. I think it would have been great if he'd have said, see this coin? Whose is this? And then it's gone. (laughs) Oh, it's behind your ear. See that? It would have been great if he would have done that, but he didn't. He wasn't really talking about the money. But they were looking for the answer to the question, whose money is this? And sometimes, sometimes we have that same, those same questions, right? Well, whose responsibility is this? Did you know in psychology there's something called a bystander error? The bystander error is if I'm the bystander and I witness something happening, then I'll just assume that there's someone else that will do it or more qualified that will do it. And so consequently, no one does anything because we're all bystanders standing there in error thinking someone else will do it when no one is doing it. You know, this is a lot how church works too. Hey, we got a day camp coming up. We need people to sign up. There's, they got all kinds of kids workers. Someone will do that. That's a bystander error. This, we can see this in our own lives, right? So it's not, it's not just whose, whose responsibility is that. It's who funds that, whose money is that, whose role is that. We can be looking for a lot of questions, and the answer to those questions should be shaped through the worldview of Imago Dei. So if I am the image bearer of God and people should see God through me, then my, my question shifts away from why isn't someone doing that? And it shifts to how can I help? Aren't you thankful that God and Jesus in heaven didn't look at each other and say, who's going to save that mess? Like, isn't that beneficial to us? Isn't that great? The the God in his infinite all of everything said, hey, son, we can fix this. Let's do this. And if we're bearing his image, then the answer to the question, we've got to change the question. And the question is, how can I help? How can I serve? What can I do? Those are the questions that we start asking. Because that's how the image of God changes us. This is what it does inside of us as it shifts our questions, not, uh, not toward how much can I do and still get by with being like kind of okay. This is what they were looking for. Well, Jesus said I didn't have to pay my tax. They were looking to just try to get by as shady as they could. And Jesus' response is is telling. If you view yourself as the image of God, if there's an Imago Dei weight that is upon you, then hey, you're going to give the government what the government needs to do, what the government does. You're going to give God what God needs to do, what God does. And this is just going to be the way that you look at the world. It's not shadiness and trying to just get by. It's what can I do to help? You need this? I've got that. I'll I'll give you a denarius. Sure. It opens us up to generosity, it opens us up to serving, it opens us up to having a true understanding that the way that we present Jesus to the world is through loving the world, not through shaming and condemnation. 
It just changes the way that we interact. And all this comes from him inscribing his law on our hearts and from understanding that we bear his image. When a lot of pastors talk about Imago Dei, uh, they naturally kind of take it um, the way that, that we as Christians view social justice. And they do this because this is one of the hot topics in the world right now, and, and, and I, I get their desire for the church to contribute to the conversation. In fact, I think the church should contribute to every conversation that's being had. I think we should do it in a way that shows love, that shows knowledge, that shows wisdom, that shows the ways of God and holiness and truth, but again, that shows love. And so I understand this, and it, and it, is, it is sort of true, right? Because we bear the image of God, slavery is wrong. Human trafficking is wrong. Intentionally taking advantage of other people is wrong. Why? Because we bear God's image. Pornography is wrong because that person bears God's image. Sex trade is wrong because that person bears God's image. Genocide is wrong. Racism is wrong. Sexism is wrong. Ageism is wrong. Like, we can categorically say these things are wrong because not only do we bear the image of God, they bear the image of God, and we should treat them with the respect that they're due. But it's so much more than just the way that we, as a church, approach social justice. And to only enter that conversation with the Imago Dei is to, is to completely discredit the weight that the Imago Dei should have on us. It's more than just the way that we look at social justice. It's actually our worldview. It's the way that we look at the world. We don't approach social justice just out of Imago Dei. We approach social justice out of the way that we view the world, and the way that we view the world is shaped and informed by the Imago Dei, that we bear God's image. It's so much bigger than what we've allowed it to be. And Jesus, again, pointing to the conversations that he's having with the Pharisees and the Herodians, is calling them out for their heart and for the lack of worldview. They just didn't get it. This is an example for us to not follow. Don't make your world about you. Your image is not your own. You bear the image of God, creator and sustainer of all the world, and the way that you interact with the world around you should reflect that. Will you stand with me? I'm going to close us in prayer. I'm going to invite you uh, to pray along with me. Father, we, God, we just come to you in humility. We don't, we don't deserve the gift that you've given us to bear your image. God, we, we're made out of the same dust from which you crafted all the animals, all the fish, all the birds, everything else. God, we're the same. The only thing that differentiates us is that you decided out of your goodness to give us your image. God, I pray that that would shape the way that we see the world. I pray, God, that when we're tempted to act in ways that are not in keeping with who you are, that Holy Spirit, you would just guard us in those moments. Steer us in a different direction. Give us the humility to just listen to your voice and your loving kindness lead us not into temptation but to deliver us from evil and let us be delivered let us follow that so that we don't find ourselves fighting against what you're trying to accomplish in us god i pray for all of us that we would approach you with humility and that we would surrender ourselves to you in a way to where you can continually fashion your image inside of us and make us more into your image God, help us. Our heart is to do what you want us to do and to faithfully point people to you. And I ask for your grace for the times that we make mistakes, mercy for the times that we fail. 
but God, that you and your grace and that your mercy, that your strength would shape us in those times so that we can image you better. God, we praise you for this and we thank you for this. In Jesus' beautiful name, amen. Amen. Church, we love you guys. We're praying for you. Be dismissed and enjoy your week.